employees' rights. Complaints about E-Verify fall largely into three categories. One, the system is inaccurate. Two, E-Verify doesn't combat identity theft. Three, the system can result in discrimination. I'd like to briefly discuss each in turn. First, accuracy. Well, today, 96.9% .9 of queries result in an automatic confirmation that the worker is employment authorized. Of the remaining 3.1% of queries, only one in 10 is ultimately found to be work authorized. Those are statistics we are very, very proud of. We've worked hard to reduce the initial mismatch rate for authorized workers. We've made changes to reduce typographical errors made by employers that had resulted in mismatches. We've added databases to our automated checks that en have enabled us to verify authorized workers more quickly. We've made system changes and entered into a partnership with the Department of State to share passport data that has enabled us to more quickly verify naturalized and derivative citizens. Even though we have had success in this area, we will continue to work harder to do even better. Not every mismatch can be prevented simply by adding data or system changes, however. For example, if someone changes their name through marriage or divorce, but doesn't then update their social security records, it can result in a mismatch. That, in fact, right now is the largest category of successfully contested mismatches. Second, identity fraud. E-Verify was not initially designed to combat identity theft or to do identity authentication. But identity theft and document fraud are growing issues that we have to grapple with. So we're trying to respond. We're giving E-Verify tools to begin to detect document fraud. Last year, we added a photo screening tool that has DHS photos in it for green cards and employment authorization documents that can be used for the Form I-9 purposes. This tool has already detected hundreds of fraudulent green cards and employment authorization documents. In FY10, we plan to add U.S. passport photos to the photo tool, and we would like to add driver's license information and photos, because driver's licenses are the most commonly used document for the Form I-9. We need the state's help to do that. We're also in the final stages of developing an initiative to let identity theft victims lock and unlock their own social security numbers in E-Verify to prevent their number being used without their knowledge. Finally, E-Verify must protect the rights of workers. We've expanded our information from workers, uh, even working with the Department of Homeland Security Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Division to create videos aimed at employee rights as well as employer rights. And we're growing our monitoring and compliance branch that is very focused on system misuse that is evidence of discrimination. In fact, this week, we put our first compliance letters in the mail to employers who may not be using E-Verify correctly. We're beginning to use a system that was just deployed at the end of June that will enable us to do more and more compliance work. We're also working to refer instances of fraud, discrimination, and system misuse to the appropriate enforcement authorities. And we work very closely with the Justice Department's Office of Special Counsel for Unfair Immigration-Related Employment Practices on charges of E-Verify-related discrimination. In summary, E-Verify has made great strides, we believe, in becoming a fast, easy to use, and more accurate tool. And we are dedicated to improving the program even more. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee. And again, we appreciate your continued support of our program. Thank you. I'd like uh, to announce the arrival of uh, Congresswoman Jackie Spears. Welcome. Thank you. 
Uh, Mr. David Rust is the Social Security Administration's Deputy Commissioner for Retirement and Disability Policy. In this role, Mr. Rust directs and manages the planning, development, and issuance of operational policy and instructions. Mr. Rust previously served as Executive Secretary for the agency, and he also held high-ranking positions with the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Agriculture, and as a professional staff member for the Congress. Mr. Russ, please proceed. And pull it right up, please. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman, Ranking Member Bill Bright, members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for this opportunity to discuss social, the Social Security Administration's supporting role in E-Verify, the DHS-administered electronic employment eligibility system. I am David Russ, the Deputy Commissioner for Retirement and Disability Policy. My responsibilities include development and coordination of policy in the oversight and the oversight of related issues to E-Verify and to our core workloads, which are the Old Age Survivors and Disability Insurance Program and the Supplemental Security Income Program. Uh, before I discuss our supporting role with E-Verify, I would like to briefly mention uh, some of the, the key purposes we have developed over the years for the use of the Social Security number. Assigning SSNs and issuing SSN cards is one of our core workloads and a key to administering our program. We developed the SSN as a way for employers to accurately report an employee's earnings. We use the SSN to credit wages to the permanent earnings record that we maintain for each worker, which is the basis of their Social Security coverage and benefits. We have great confidence in the integrity of our records, and for our per program purposes, the SSN serves us very well. Let me now turn to our role in the E-Verify program. An employer submits information for, on a new hire to DHS. DHS then sends this information to us electronically to verify the SSN, the name, and the date of birth in our records. For new hires alleging U.S. citizenship, we confirm citizenship status based on information in our records. For any naturalized citizen whose U.S. citizenship we cannot confirm, DHS verifies the naturalization status and thus authorization for work. For all non-citizens, if there is a match with our records, DHS then determines current work authorization status. DHS notifies the employer of the result of the verification. E-Verify automatically confirms, as Ms. Ratliff said, work authorization in 96.9% .9 of all queries. Next month, we will complete a much anticipated improvement in our computer systems that serve E-Verify. Currently, we use the same system developed in the late 1990s when E-Verify was a small pilot program in just five states. Our improved system, known as the isolated environment, will ensure that there is no interference between our own mission-critical workloads and DHS's E-Verify program. At the request of DHS, we designed the system to handle up to 60 million queries a year, but we can increase that capacity with additional hardware and funding if the need arises. The new system also includes redundancy measures that ensure that E-Verify does not experience unnecessary outages. We work, with DH we work closely with DHS over the last few years to improve the E-Verify program. The changes that that have increased the efficiency, and these, excuse me, these changes have increased the efficiency and effectiveness of the system and have helped to control the workload effects on our field offices. In the last two years, these changes reduced by about half the number of workers who need to visit our offices to resolve tentative non-confirmations. In fiscal year 2009, we will handle about 75 contacts for every 10,000 queries run through the E-Verify system. Despite these improvements, we remain focused on further reducing the need for workers to visit our field offices to resolve tentative non-confirmations. Madam Chairwoman, our own uh, mission-critical workloads are increasing at an alarming rate. Based on the newest economic assumptions and actuarial projections, we now estimate nearly 250,000 more retirement claims will be filed and 350,000 more disability claims will be filed in fiscal year 2010 than we projected in the President's FY 2010 budget, which was delivered to Congress in May. Our field offices are under great strain to keep pace with these growing workloads. 
Any additional field office visits related to E-Verify will only add more challenges to our efforts to deliver the level of service the public expects and deserves. I must also mention that under the Social Security Act, we cannot use trust fund dollars to finance the work we do for E-Verify or any other work that does not fall within our core mission as specified in the Social Security Act. Since E-Verify began, Congress has appropriated funds to DHS to administer the program, and each year DHS has provided funds to us to cover our E-Verify related cost. These include our systems cost and the cost of assisting new hires in resolving tentative non-confirmations. Receiving timely and, and adequate reimbursement from DHS for our E-Verify work is thus critical to us. In conclusion, I want to thank you for giving me an opportunity to discuss our role in assisting the DHS administer, to, in assisting DHS in administering the E-Verify system. We look forward to your continued support for our critical programs. I will be glad to answer any questions you may have. by asking the first few questions. Um, first to Ms. Ratliff. Um, Secretary Napolitano recently announced that starting on September 8, 2009, the administration would implement a regulation requiring that federal contractors use E-Verify according to the uh, USCIS statistics and E-Verify has handled more than six million queries thus far this fiscal year. How many queries do you anticipate E-Verify will need to handle next year if the federal contractor rule is implemented? Madam Chairwoman, we estimate that in the first year, about 3.8 million queries mm -hmm. would be run pursuant to that regulation. Uh, there's little under 170,000 federal contractors in our analysis. And um, given our current system capacity of, of over 60 million queries annually, we are well poised to meet that challenge. OK, do you see any problems in the system? These are staggering numbers. We are always analyzing to see what could be tweaked and fixed and made better. Um, we feel that we do have a program that is ready to handle the challenges of the federal contractor role and other growth. Um, we have a team of, of system engineers, program experts who are always looking to see what could be improved, could our educational materials be more extensive. Um, we've added languages uh, to our materials where to implement the federal contractor rule. We are planning now a second wave of outreach to federal contractors through webinars and other um, events to make sure they have the information they need to successfully enroll and use E-Verify. Um, we have a, in the registration process, a tailored approach for contractors and a tailored tutorial. We are always open to ideas for additional improvements and other um, materials, but we do feel that we're ready. All right. Uh, do you support giving E-Verify uh, participants the option of verifying current employee, uh, employees? And could E-Verify handle the potential increase? I think you probably have already answered that. Well, our 3.8 million query estimate under the federal contractor rule for the first year does include an estimate for uh, a certain number of contractors choosing to run their entire existing workforce, which would be an option under that regulation. Um, and we also are constantly doing forecasting and um, building costing models for other larger scenarios so that we would be ready for um, whatever Congress sees fit to send our way. And how effective is E-Verify in authenticating employees' identities as well as authorizing their right to work. Identity fraud is something that we're spending a lot of time thinking about and developing the tools that are, are possible for us to put in our toolkit. Uh, we cannot today catch every form of identity fraud. We have the photo tool um, that we were using to 
the fullest ability um, that we can use it by putting Department of Homeland Security identi identity document photos in it for the new hires who show a green card or an employment authorization document for the Form I-9. We're planning next year to put in the photo tool, the U.S. passport citizen photos. But the biggest document used for the Form I-9 is the driver's license. And um, we, on our end, have done outreach to states to see if there is a willing partner who would work with us to add their driver's license photos to the photo tool. That is the step that would take us the farthest down the path of detecting identity fraud in terms of the photo tool. We're also monitoring for duplicate uses of social security numbers. and. Um, will be referring to ICE, our sister enforcement agency, identity fraud patterns that we see under that initiative. We are exploring in-house possible biometric and biographic-based identity authentication options. I know that is a topic of great interest, and um, we are already looking to see and working with stakeholders, um, including in the business community, um, all stakeholders who are interested in working with us to put good ideas together and see what would be um, worth testing out and learning right. from. Uh, let me just refer to um, ICE and the uh, raids that were held in 2007 on the Swift uh, Meatpacking Company. Yes, and uh, I understand it netted about 1,200 workers and reported, uh, reportedly contributed to $30 million in losses uh, to the company. And uh, it's my understanding that SWIFT participated and still participants in E-Verify pilot programs, you know, were found uh, and they were not verified. So can you explain uh, what the breakdown in the system was at that time, what the weaknesses were and how you plan? Yes, Madam Chair. To overcome those. And the photo tool that we have added to the system was added after the SWIFT incident. And the I, photo I, tool, are you faces? With our, yes, ma'am, it's, okay. it's the green card and employment authorization document photos. So when a new hire shows one of those documents to the employer for the Form I-9 process, we are now able to pull up in the system the photo that should be on that card the photo that we put on the card. So if the new hire is using a completely fraudulent green card or employment authorization document or has taken a real card and photo substituted their picture, the photo tool will detect that by showing the photo that should be on the card. So it is a very easy match. It's, it's not a matter of saying, well, if you got a haircut and your shirt is different, it should be exactly 100% the same photo that we put on the card. And as we're working to expand the photo tool, that will expand our ability to help employers detect identity fraud. And I, I do want to note that SWIFT, you're absolutely right, it underscores why we are moving to add tools to E-Verify to allow employers to detect identity fraud and why we need to do more. Uh, my time has expired, so I'm going to yield to our um, ranking member, Mr. Bilbray. Thank you. I guess the point here, we had a hearing um, not too long ago, Madam Chair, about the improvement of the federal uh, identification systems and the, the new uh, technologies we're using there. So, Ms. Ratliff, as the states and the federal government improve our um, uh, documentation ourselves, our IDs itself, that will strengthen the E-Verify because that is a basis for a lot of these, this information gathering, isn't it? Yes, sir. To the extent that E-Verify is able to have access to those photos on those identity documents, yes. Okay, so that you can't operate in isolation. As other improvements are made, as the states improve their programs, as the feds improve theirs, your efficiency will be approved proportionally down the line. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Russ, you've been, you've been resting for too long. I'm going to have to get to you. <laughs> um, the WSAT, uh, WSAT um, commissioned a... Um, um, 
a study that came out and said that there was 99.6 confirmation of U.S. citizens to the program um, for native born, uh, or 90, no, 99.9. .9. That was pretty substantial. And that the 97 are for foreign, foreign born uh, 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 nationals. The question is, is I, I guess that also reflects the fact that that's where the most fraud is, is in foreign born. Is that safe to assume that? I think intuitive you could assume that, but I think this is one of the things we're looking at all the time. We're looking at ways to make the information in the Nubinet more accurate, uh, have a, a more substantial basis for it. We've increased the evidentiary requirements for the information in the Nubinet. So we're also, uh, just as DHS is doing, we're continually improving the, the, the quality of the data in the system to reduce that number. And, and Ms. Ratliff was bringing up this issue of women forget, um, forgetting to notify Social Security when they change, when they get married, change their name. I don't know why ladies do that, but this just happens to be some kind of conspiracy out here to confuse the system. Uh, but at the same time, we have the same problem with, you know, coming from local government, we have the same problem with IDs in state government trying to get the names changed. It's always a big deal about notifying people, go to your DMV, look at your registration and a lot of other stuff. Um, my question is, is that with the accuracy le level that we have with E-Verify, um, the uh, Social Security Administration provides Social Security payments for individuals. I'm looking at a comparison to this level of efficiency. What is the percentage um, of payments that are sent out to the wrong person um, uh, or not sent out at all? What's the efficiency of, of the um, um, Social Security payments to retired individuals? Mr. Bilberry, uh, I may have to provide that for the record, That's uh, if, if you don't mind. I, I appreciate that. And you know, I'll just say this because uh, I think that those of us that have worked in local government look at this percentage, 99.6, 90, you know, we, when you get up in the, the, the high 90s, you really are at a level that government very seldom ventures into. And so I was very interested but, in, in that aspect of it. Uh, but remember, for the people who are our beneficiaries, they have a, a vested interest in letting us know changes of address, changes of name, and things of that nature. We're sending them a benefit every month. So they're very good about coming in to us and correcting the record. Where the bigger gap for us is that many of us got our Social Security card when we were 16. Now many are enumerated at birth. But then you may go decades without having any interaction with the Social Security Administration. It is during that period of time when we probably have the greatest discrepancies in the data. When a person gets ready to draw benefits, they're in to see us and to correct those situations. Right. Another thing we do is we send a statement out every year, the Social Security statement, to everybody above age 25. And it has information in there on earnings and other information. And we ask people if there's anything wrong with the data we are presenting to you in this Social Security statement, will you come and notify us so we can correct it? So we're trying on a regular basis to get those things cleaned I'd up. I'd also be interested in the people that get checks after their loved ones have passed away and forget to notify you. I think that's one of those deals. Mr. Russ, um, the uh, phase two has been pretty successful, but um, what is the average to waiting time to resolve a mismatch over the phone? Um, what type of issues can, um, can um, be resolved over the phone? For, from our point of view, I believe, I believe you have a, a telephone response system, correct? Maybe um, you might want to yes, respond if, and if then I'll I respond. If I might answer, um, the Social Security Administration mismatches are typically resolved by an in-person visit. It's the DHS mismatches that we have a process where you can call us. We have a 1-800 number. Um, we typically are able to resolve, it's over 90% of those calls within two days. Um, in addition, we most recently added another um, um, option for citizens to call DHS instead of going into SSA where they had a naturalization related mismatch. And we are able to check our naturalization records and 90% of the time we're able over the phone to find that, to confirm their citizenship. And this could be a case where uh, they naturalized and haven't yet gone to SSA to update their citizenship status, but we know they naturalized, we naturalized them. So with just a phone call, we're able to verify um, that they are in fact work authorized. 
for the ones that come to us, it's almost all walk in. It, it, there's very little that can be resolved by the phone. And they have, I think, seven or eight days to, to contact us. And then we resolve it as quickly as we can. It depends a lot, in many cases, on how quickly they give us the documentation. Bring in a marriage certificate. Marriage certificate. Uh, if they don't have a, a birth certificate, and, and they may have to go to the vital records in their home state or something of that nature, they have to get some sort of documentation to resolve the issue for us. And all of this will be streamlined as the states go into um, basically um, going to electronic data files on birth certificates and all that other stuff, which is a different yes. piece of legislation. And, that's de and death records and things of that nature. That all, all, all those electronic systems help us keep our, our database up to date. Thank you. I will now yield to uh, Congresswoman Spears. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Radcliffe, 103,000 employers approximately participate voluntarily in E-Verify, according to our briefing paper. So what percentage of the employers in this country are actually participating in E-Verify then? Well, there's two statistics we use to answer that question. One is the 100 and, you know, the, the statistics on the number of employers is always hard to keep accurate because it changes every day with about 1,000 more adding each week. The number, um, the current number is 137,000. That represents over a half a million work sites because one employer. No, I understand that. I just want to know how many employers you have as a percentage. Do you yes, have that figure? Yes, ma'am. It's, it's a half a million divided into about 7.2 million employers nationwide. So it's about 1 14th of the, um, of okay. the U.S. workforce, or the U.S. employer. So a very workforce. small percentage. It is small, of yes, ma'am. The employers. Why isn't we have it um, made it mandatory? Well, Congress authorized it as a pilot um, to make sure that um, it was working appropriately and was scalable for seven million employers. And I think that um, as a matter of the program perspective, not as a matter of the policy perspective. We are building a program that could be made mandatory so that when the time is right, um, we can be successful. So how long do you, how much longer do you think you need to be able to absorb, um, you know, 13, 14 more of a uh, workforce? As a matter of the IT infrastructure, we are ready today. We have a, a system capability of 65 million queries today. And on average, there's about 60 to 65 million new hires a year. Um, as a matter of the staff to do monitoring and compliance, um, we don't want to hire staff um, earlier than, and incur costs for salaries, et cetera, earlier than the, the workforce um, would, um, the ratio would support. But we have training modules. Can we, you give me a, just an estimate? I mean, is it two years away? Is it three years away? The, you're saying the IT is up and running. Yes, ma'am. So you don't have the, the workforce to accommodate the kinds of inquiries. Is that basically what's missing? We, we could, within several years, hire staff to support um, um, monitoring and compliance if Congress saw fit to um, fund it at that level and to, uh, we could today support the mismatch resolution process. And do these employers who are voluntarily participating in the program right now, do they pay a fee for doing so? E-Verify is free. It's free? Yes, ma'am. So if we were to charge for it, what would we charge for it? Well, we would have to look at how Congress chose to phase in E-Verify. Um, the costs would go down per query as more employers were enrolled. Past forms of legislation over the last few years have had varying phase-in years, so that would be a big factor. Also, if Congress chose to add um, a specific form of biometric, that would in influence the cost. Right now, the authorizing statute doesn't speak to identity authentication. All right, what I would like for you to do, Ms. Radcliffe, if you would, is just provide to the committee what the actual cost would be per employer if it was going to operate on a user fee basis. Yes, ma'am. Um, I can't imagine that employers wouldn't embrace something like E-Verify because what they're required to do now is very time consuming. 
and it's, it's a huge cost to business. So if there was a simple IT solution, I think that they would they would embrace it. I'm just kind of surprised that more employers haven't taken advantage of it. But the generally yield just for a second. I certainly will. Especially mm -hmm. if we went to a universal ap application, because then you would divide the the the, the total costs among the, the entire universe rather than just those who were volunteering. That's yield. right. As I understand, uh, Ms. Spears, it's uh, optional. And so if we, maybe we can do this, make it uh, permanent, and then once we get that information out, spread across the universe, I think the fee would be minimum. But we need that information. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I have a question for you. Uh, you. Did you want to respond to that? Uh, if I could. Um, it would, it, from our point of view, we'd be glad to work with DHS on, on, uh, on bringing about mandatory coverage, but we would ask that funding would be an issue, adequate funding to, for, for it would be an issue, because it would take us from something like 50,000 people walking into our offices to probably 450,000 or thereabouts if we went up to the level of 60 million a year. Uh, being run through. So it would be a substantial workload increase on the Social Security field offices. Uh, the systems aspect of it would not be very costly for us because we've, we've modernized that and we think it can handle those number of queries. But there'd certainly be a fallout in, the, in our field offices that would be substantial. Well, I mean, the answer may be in trying to do sectors um, of employers over a period of time and, and, and bring them on board over a number of years as opposed to just turning a switch and having the program operate. I have one question for you, Mr. Rust. In California, we have taken action to prevent the use of Social Security numbers as a health insurance identifier. Is that also the law on a federal level? Our, our position has been since the, the, since the agency was created in the mid-30s. That the, that the Social Security number is not a national ID number, that it was created specifically for the use in, yeah. in maintaining records on people's employment and earnings to determine their benefits. We actively discourage the private use of the numbers, but it's widely used. That's okay, so the answer to my question is no, there is no federal law that prevents health insurers from using Social Security numbers as an identifier. Not that I'm aware of. All right, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, and now we'll call on Mr. Connolly. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman, and uh, thank you for holding these hearings. Uh, I'd ask without objection my opening statement be entered into the record at this point. Without objection. I thank the Chair. Um, a number, uh, let me walk through this just, just a little bit to make sure I, I understand where we are in E-Verify. Uh, the Bush administration started this program with congressional support on an optional and voluntary basis. Is that correct? No. The program has actually been authorized for about 10 years, so it, it has spanned um, several administrations. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. Uh, the program actually was implemented under the Clinton administration under the pilot, the five-member pilot program, and yield back. But remaining a, an optional voluntary program. It's yep. Correct? Yes, sir. Now, you've had a number, of, for example, of federal contractors who have participated in the program on a voluntary basis as part of the pilot. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And has that worked successfully? It has. Um, we have had about 2,000 employers, as they've registered, self-select as federal contractors. In anticipation of the federal contractor rule becoming effective, we built a registration module where a business could self-identify as a federal contractor. And about 2,000 have so far taken advantage of that. I talked with some federal contractors last week who participated in the pilot program yeah. at the behest of the federal government. You're familiar with some of those candidates? With some of the 2,000 who were participating in E-Verify? Yes. Um, I, I know a few of them, yes, sir. Right. One of the concerns they had was that when you move to the new stage in this program in September, that all of the hard work they've done in E-Verifying their employees is not going to, they're not going to get credit for it. They have to start all over again as if they were like anybody else who didn't participate in the pilot or voluntary program. Is that correct? That is partially correct, sir. If I may explain, the, the new hires who they have already run through E-Verify, they will not need to run again. Um, beginning September 8th, under the federal contractor regulation, they will have to run an additional portion of their 
current workforce, three verify, and those are the people who they're going to put on the federal contract. So that between their new hires and the workforce working on the federal contract that were already in place, they can have um, staffing to the federal project that has been 100% run through E-Verify. So there will be a piece that they have to do that's additional. They also will have the option to query E-Verify for their entire current workforce, uh, whether or not those employees are working on a federal contract. Well, I'm not sure I understood your answer. If, if I'm a federal contractor who volunteered and participated in the pilot program for E-Verify, it was only for new hires? Currently, yes, sir. Those new hires, if they're still on my payroll, I won't have to go back and, and duplicate the E-Verification of those? That's correct. You okay. will not have to. All right. Because I, I think there was some confusion about that in terms of what the okay. requirement's going to be. Were there some federal contractors who uh, went beyond new hires and, in fact, used E-Verify for their current workforce? If any employer has done that, it would be a misuse of E-Verify. They were not allowed to do that? It would not be proper. But it will be proper come September? Yes. As of September 8th, if they run current workers who are assigned to a federal contract, that will be a part of their requirement. And then they also could choose to run their entire current workforce. You know, they, large companies, they may have employees who are on federal contracts. They may have a whole group of other employees who work on private sector projects. Why would it have been a misuse? Why, in fact, would it be a misuse of E-Verify today for me to do that, but it will be an option available to me in two months? Because the way our statute is written, it is just for new hires. It is not for current workforce. The pres President Bush signed an executive order that is the underpinning of the federal contractor regulation that said in order to ensure a stable and work authorized federal workforce, because we already are running federal government new hires through E-Verify, um, the administration wanted to ensure that the federal contractors, who are also working on federal government projects, had also been run through E-Verify. And the executive order found that for the interest of a secure, stable federal workforce, contractors who were moving to a federal contract should also be queried and verified through E-Verify. Hmm. Uh, what about the potential misuse of this database? Um, we've had hearings of this committee about the issue of cybersecurity. We have had testimony that the, the incidents of hacking and attempting, attempted hacking into federal databases have skyrocketed. Um, and uh, with the best of intentions with E-Verify, are we putting federal contractors at risk of uh, similar hacking incidents, what kind of security provisions are we undertaking to ensure that those databases are secure and people's privacy isn't unwittingly invaded? Sir, E-Verify is a matter of the IT infrastructure meets the very stringent Department of Homeland Security IT security standards. We also meet all Privacy Act standards. Our Privacy impact assessment and system of records notices are both up to date with how we use our information, and we will continue to meet those stringent standards um, with an eye toward the importance of the very issues you're, you're mentioning. Madam Chairman, my time is up, but I would just say to you, Ms. Ratliff, that's a bureaucratic answer. Uh, my question was, what measures are you taking? Meeting standards, lots of federal agencies are meeting standards, and the hacking incidents are growing and becoming more successful. And my question to you was, what are we doing with this new program, creating this new database for federal contractors to ensure their security? Meeting standards is not a satisfactory answer for this member of Congress. I know we're out of time, but I, I would commit to submitting information, meeting with your staff to discuss this in detail. 
Okay, my time is up. Yes. Mr. Bilber. Madam Chair, I'd, I'd just like to point out, because I think it's quite appropriate as we develop these systems that we armor them and protect them, and that is a universal application. A gentleman from Fairfax County can be reminded, too, that one of the greatest identity thefts in the United States, and I think um, Mr. Russ will reinforce this, is the hijacking of people's Social Security numbers. And this helps to armor that to some degree. So as we look at the high-tech threat of going to the um, going to the electronic system, we also need to recognize that it's the low tech where the greatest abuse of social security um, identity theft is, and that is just people getting a number and being able to use it because we don't have a check system. The old I-9 documentation system has been a farce. We've all known it. So as we move forward, I think the gentleman from Fairfax is pointing out that, um, that as we move away from an old system that was very vulnerable, Let's try to armor the new system and protect it. Um, that's an issue that we've been talking about with E-Verify and all our electronic data stuff. So I yield back, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chair. And I just have a, one more, a few more questions to ask Mr. Russ, and then we're going to move on to the second panel. But the House passed uh, the version of uh, the fiscal year 2010 Homeland Security Appropriations Bill. It was H.R. 2892. And it includes a provision to require that both the Social Security Administration and the Department of Homeland Security enter into an agreement each fiscal year to provide funding to the Social Security Administration to cover the full cost of the agency's E-Verified related responsibilities. And what uh, do you think about this provision? Did you know about it? Uh, we've had a very good working relationship with DHS, and, they, and we've been able to work this out year after year to, to get the adequate funding that, that we need to do, the most, especially the, the fallout that occurs in our field. We always appreciate when Congress helps us to make certain that we get that level of funding, but our relationship with DHS has been very collegial, and this has worked very well. Okay. And do you believe that the Social Security Administration uh, can, with this uh, provision, uh, receive the kind of funding for E-Verify in the absence of such a statutory requirement. And uh, given our uh, crisis at the time, uh, how do you think this is going to really facilitate what you do? I think it will simply reinforce the relationship we've had, the, 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 the excellent working relationship we've had. Um, so I, I, think, I think it will be helpful in that sense. One of the things I would stress, why we, why we stress the, Im the importance of this, I mentioned the growth in our workloads in terms of 250,000. This is more retirees than we expected, 350,000 more disability claims. We, we budgeted for 2.5 million. This is 350,000 on top of that. So we, we are an agency under stress in that sense. So, so uh, any assistance we get from DHS to help handle that workload is very much appreciated and very critical to us. Uh, a 2006 report by the Social Security Administration, Inspector General, on the accuracy of the Numident database, um, I guess uh, it relied on, it was relied on by E-Verified, and it found that uh, there were discrepancies in approximately 17.8 million of the 435 million Numident records could result in an incorrect feedback. The report noted particular concern about the extent of incorrect citizenship information and what's been done to improve the accuracy of uh, Numident. And uh, have any more recent studies uh, been conducted on this particular issue? And how do you expect the Social Security Administration and its field offices to be impacted by the new federal contractor rule? To answer your second question first, we, we have gotten it to the point now where about 0.75 percent or about 75 out of every 10,000 queries that go through E-Verify end up in someone walking into our offices to resolve an, a non-confirmation. So as you if we are able to maintain that, and we've worked very closely with our colleagues to reduce, to reduce that number, that workload, but as the number of, of matches, as the number of 
of the verifications go through E-Verify, if that ratio holds, we'll see more and more people coming into our offices. And so, again, like I say, just two years ago it was 3%, now it's down to 0.75. So working with DHS, we've substantially reduced that, but it's still a, a fairly sizable workload. So like I say, this year it's over 50,000 visits to our office related to, uh, to E-Verify non, I mean, uh, yeah, e -verify non confirmations. Uh, going back to your first question, that the, the 17 million is 4.1% of the entries. They, the Inspector General looked not at those cases of, for instance, if you had ones that were no match in, uh, in the uh, uh, E-Verify system. This was just a, an overall look at the NUMA debt. We have about 450, now about 455 million entries in there. Everybody who's had a Social Security number since 1936 has an entry in there. Um, as I mentioned, I think to, to Mr. Bilbray a little while ago, most of the information we get comes from individuals telling us stuff. So if you went and got your Social Security card at 16 and then you don't come to us again for many years, you could, that's when the, the marriage could happen, a name change could happen, a divorce could happen. Uh, other things like that can happen that would then cause a discrepancy in the number. Uh, so we have mechanisms for clear, clearing it up and for strengthening it. You asked what we've done to strengthen the Numident. One, I mentioned the Social Security statement, which goes out every year presents the information to people and ask them if, if there's any discrepancies to, to contact us to, cl to clean it up. Secondly, we use enhanced evidentiary requirements now. We, we have birth certificates, we, have, we see marriage licenses and marriage certificates, we, we see naturalization papers. Uh, we, we ask for documentation now when people come in to make these corrections. So we think the Numidan is steadily becoming more accurate. Um, we, uh, uh, we now enumerate uh, most children born in the United States at birth, so that's going to give us uh, um, um, the, the hospitals will handle it, the state uh, statistics units will be handling it, so we'll be getting data electronically, we'll be getting it cleaner, we'll be getting it quicker, uh, and then we'll know citizenship because they were born in this country. And so things of that nature, these electronic mechanisms we're doing to make the data more accurate uh, and more up to date. I'm going to yield now to Mr. Bilberry. Yes. The gentleman from uh, the great Commonwealth of Virginia brought up a very interesting issue, and this is about the fact that we created barriers in the past from having employers use E-Verify on existing employees. And I, and I think to clarify, there were concerns about who would pick and choose which employees, and we created that barrier for a good reason for that time. But he did bring up this item that I've got to say um, uh, shows why these hearings are great. Is there a reason why, or is there a great barrier for the federal government to lead through example and start a process of phasing in, checking all our existing employees, as pointed out by the gentleman from Fairfax County? Could the federal government, do we have the capability to lead through example and start having our own internal operation now start checking up with these? That was an, an issue that we actually looked at quite deeply last year. Um, the leading by example was um, a theme of great interest to the last administration um, as well as now. And we, we did spend time looking at um, what are the current processes um, that the current workers have already been run through to verify their work authorization status. And um, given that um, it was found that they are already quite rigorous, and so at that time it didn't seem an appropriate use of, of resources to basically duplicate um, what had already been done in other steps through um, security checks, OPM and checks, that, um, and also the government's preparation for the HSPD 12 process of of producing even more secure identity documents for, for us as employees. Um, but that was something that was looked at very deeply. Okay, and I would like to see that because I think that we need to revisit it and make sure that just because the majority of the time it, we have already covered it because of other security checks and stuff doesn't mean there isn't enough that we need to look into. Um, and while we're on the subject, seeing that you've got two former county chairmen here, when we do this contract requirement. Does that apply to our local governments when we start giving them grants? Um, and are we going to now start requiring government that gets our money to start responding in the same manner that we're requiring the private sector to respond? 
The federal, the answer to your question is no. Um, the, the FAR regulation does have some discrete exemptions. Um, uh, subcontractors for contract values of less than $3,000 are exempted. COTS, the commercial office help products, those contracts are exempted as well. Okay. Now, now you said that for the private sector. Uh, how about the public sector? When they, is there any requirement that we that local governments, when they start getting grants, that we start phasing this? I'm wondering about this issue because when we start giving transportation funds, the American people are starting to say we want to make sure that that federal funds aren't going into going into fraud. Are we requiring that at all on our on our states and our counties and our cities as they get federal funds? Has this become a tradition, or have we just mm -hmm. basically been blindsided on that and we're just working on the private sector right now? The grants are excluded from the okay. FAR regulation. Okay. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I have a feeling that we need to revisit this whole thing, again, leading through example, and that means the federal government and the local government and the states need to lead through example. You yes. about. Mr. Connolly of Virginia. I have no further questions for this right. panel, Madam Chair. Mr. Duncan of California. Tennessee. Tennessee, excuse me. Come on to California. You're from California. <laughs> They're all coming to California. Well, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to get here before now, but uh, uh, l let me just ask you a couple of quick questions. Uh, how much, how much are, are we spending? How much does the federal government spend on a, this program at this time? Sir, our, the, the verified budget for this year um, is comprised of about $100 million in appropriations that was given for FY09. And we also had 20 or $30 million from um, FY08 appropriations that we wisely and efficiently did not spend and it rolled over. So this year we will be spending um, close to the $120, $130 uh, million dollar, um, budget. Um, some of those are one-time costs for system improvements that will not need to be um, put into our baseline program funding. And is, is my information accurate that there's now 134,000 employers or companies that have used this system? Well, that was three weeks ago. It's growing by 1,000 a week, so now we're up to about 137. That was going to be my next question, how fast it was growing, and it's growing at about 1,000 more employers per week. Yes, sir. And, and uh, I'm also told that right now there's uh, one employee for each uh, uh, 1,250 employers, roughly. And, and, and it's a voluntary program right now. So uh, uh, do you think uh, the uh, DHS could, could, uh, is equipped to make this program mandatory? Sir, in terms of our staffing, uh, there's a certain baseline staffing you need, um, whether E-Verify has 1,000 employers in it or 7 million. Uh, for example, it, it takes a certain number of, of um, staff to write a regulation, no matter how many employers it's going to affect. So that our staffing number, we have about um, 200 employees right now working on E-Verify, roughly. Um, that will not grow in huge numbers as the program grows. A lot of that is a baseline program staffing. Um, the pieces that grow, the biggest piece will be outreach. So we're appropriately helping uh, employers who are signing up know how to use the system and monitoring and compliance. So we're able to make sure those employers are using the system properly and reaching out to them if they're not. Um, so we have been basically building a program that would be ready if Congress chooses to make it mandatory. Um, and I, um, I think that we are very far down the road in terms of being ready um, should Congress um, authorize um, such a change to the program. And, and the seven million figure that you mentioned just a few moments ago, is that the number of employers that your department estimates are in this country today? Yes, sir. We use a statistic of about 7.2 million employers. 7.2 million. So, so even that high figure of 137,000 employers using this system now is, is uh, just a tiny percentage then of the total number of employers in the country. 
it is the 137,000 represents about a half a million work sites, and that is the more apples to apples comparison to the 7.2 million. But um, yes, we we look forward to a lot more growth in E-Verify as more employers join. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Radcliffe, Mr. Rust, uh, for your witnessing. We appreciate it, and you may now uh, leave the table. I'd like to uh, invite our second panel to, of witnesses to come forth. And remain standing, please. It's uh, the committee's policy that uh, all witnesses are sworn in. I'd like you to raise your right hand as I administer the oath. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. And let the record show that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. You may now be seated. I ask that each one of you now give a brief summary of your testimony and uh, to keep your testimony within five minutes if you can because your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. Thank you. I first would uh, like to introduce Ms. Gina Baker McNeil and who is the Heritage Foundation's Homeland Security Policy Analyst where she focuses on border security, immigration, technology, and other issues. She previously worked for the Hutchison Group LLC as a research assistant and as an environmental management consultant for Booz Allen Hamilton and for former Maryland Governor Robert Ehrlich. <coughs> uh, Ms. McNeil, would you please proceed now? Thank, Thank you. Madam. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. <clears throat> Madam Chairwoman, Ranking Member Bill Bray, and the members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the topic of E-Verify. I should state beforehand that the views expressed in this testimony are my own and should not be construed as representative of an official position of the Heritage Foundation. Workplace immigration enforcement is vital to breaking the cycle of dependency on illegal labor. These policies, however, should center on three goals. First, keeping America free. Second, keeping America safe. And third, keeping it prosperous. We should not compromise one of these goals to gain another, and all three can and should be met with respect to America's immigration policies. E-Verify is a tool that meets these requirements. But I want to emphasize up front that E-Verify remains only one piece of the immigration puzzle. The right approach to solving the immigration dilemma will include the following aspects. First, enforcement of immigration laws in the workplace. Second, a safeguarding of the southern border. Third, promotion of economic development in Latin America to provide illegal immigrants economic opportunities at home. Fourth, enhancement of legal worker programs here in the U.S. to meet the needs of employers and immigrants. Fifth, reforms at citizenship and immigration services to handle legal immigration in a better way. And finally, strengthening of citizenship requirements and programs to foster assimilation. Effective enforcement doesn't require a costly amnesty that would erode rule of law and be patently unfair to legal immigrants. E-Verify tackles the immigration problem by going to the heart of what draws illegal immigrants to the U.S., finding employment. At present, more than 137,000 employers participate in E-Verify voluntarily, and E-Verify is being used to determine work authorization for one in four new hires nationwide. Contributing to this success is that E-Verify helps employers enforce immigration laws in a way that is humane and fair, cost-effective for business, and maintains privacy. E-Verify can determine quickly and accurately the authenticity of the personal information 
and credentials offered by new hires. Of course, E-Verify isn't without its challenges. It has low error rates, but more can be done to drive down the rate of error. While the software is free, there is a cost to doing business with E-Verify, but this cost is negated by driving down other costs, such as the cost of having to find a new employee later if an employee turns out to be illegal, or the stiff penalties if discovered. Finally, the only personal information entered into E-Verify is the employee's name, date of birth, social security number, and citizenship status. This is information already on the I-9, and neither the E-Verify employees nor the employer can access any more information maintaining privacy. The administration's recent announcement to abandon Social Security no match, however, is a step backwards in terms of workplace enforcement. This action sends the message that DHS will not enforce the law against employing illegal workers. Furthermore, DHS has yet to implement the federal contractor's provision signed by President Bush in 2008, which requires all federal contractors to use E-Verify. The administration has announced plans to comply, and this is a step in the right direction. Going forward, Congress should permanently authorize E-Verify and provide adequate funding for its implementation. DHS should craft E-Verify rules to apply to all workers under federal government contracts, otherwise the result would be less workplace enforcement, not more. DHS and Congress should work together to drive down the already low error rates. And finally, DHS should not abandon no match, but should instead move forward with it. At the same time, Congress should grant the Social Security Administration the ability to share data directly with DHS, allowing DHS to target large-scale employers of illegal workers. A truly smart and tough enforcement policy will be one that creates disincentives to unlawful immigration, is cost-effective, protects individual data and privacy, and minimizes the burdens on employers while addressing concerns over safety and security. E-Verify does this, meeting those ultimate goals of keeping America free, keeping it safe, and keeping it prosperous. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. All right. And we'll proceed now to, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. Angelo Amador. He serves as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's uh, Executive Director of Immigration Policy, where he works with uh, business leaders to shape the uh, Chamber's position on immigration reform, legalization, border security, visa processing, and guest worker programs. Mr. Amador also represents the Chamber before the Congress and federal agencies. Mr. Amador, please proceed. Thank you very much. Um, I had prepared some, uh, an oral statement, but after listening to the questions, I, I'd rather use uh, the six minutes or the five minutes that I have uh, to give some concrete examples of uh, what you have been talking about. Um, a lot have been said about you know, what DHS should mandate or not mandate. Uh, I will point out again that the underlying law says the Secretary of Homeland Security may not require any person or other entity to participate in the E-Verify program. Uh, they call it pilot programs, but you know, it's the underlying law that uh, gave to the creation of uh, E-Verify. We do believe that you know, Congress has that authority to mandate it. Uh, that's why we continue to come to Congress, and that's why we're here today. Now, I also want to point out that it's been said, you know, let's put a fee because this program is free and the word free is used uh, uh, quite a lot. Uh, actually, using E-Verify doesn't do away with any of the other requirements. You still need to do the I-9, you still need to do the other uh, processing that you need to do when you hire a new worker. It is estimated that already employers spend between 10 to 12 million hours uh, in the hiring and processing of uh, about 50, as you heard, 50 to 60 million uh, workers. A study uh, in 2005 said that the estimated total compliance cost of workplace, workplace regulations is about $91 billion. Five years later, when they did a, a follow-up study using $2,004, the cost was already at $106 billion. When you make these requirements, and we had a witness come that owned about uh, seven franchisees, Burger King franchises, uh, he testified as to the cost of training, the cost of uh, uh, following up with uh, uh, 
tentative non-confirmation, attorneys, and all of these things. So when you think about a fee, I, I just want to point out this is not free. You know, the, the employers are willing to help the government uh, with that mandated program. Uh, we're willing to support, and we have supported uh, mandated programs in the past. We could support a federal contractor's mandate, but only if it have certain requirements. One of the, the numbers they used in, in the prior panel was one fourteenth of all employers use this. This is less than one percent. Now, when we look at, uh, um, actually, sorry, this is seven percent. When we look at this body of uh, uh, employers, it's very small. Most of the comments I get from people complaining about the program and complaining about what is about to be required are people using the program. They sign an MOU, which is a contract. They agree with the government to do certain things. What Congress is saying and what the administration is saying is to change that contract. They agree to verify new hires. We hear that the program can handle 60 million queries. That's about how many new hires you have every year. That doesn't, that doesn't count uh, re-verification. It is interesting that every time the government has looked at running their own program, which has been an idea, and it's the idea that is being pushed by AFL, CIO, and might be one of the only things we agree with them in this Congress. Uh, they, the government looks at it, they always say, well, let's only do new hires. But if we're going to implement it on, on uh, 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 employers, let's do everybody. I was just talking to UPS uh, uh, two days ago, and they were telling me that they have 250,000 employees in the United States. They uh, um, cannot verify which one is going to touch a package that goes to under a federal contract, so they will have to re-verify every single individual. They've been using e-verify since 2007. So it uh, adds an additional hurdle if they have to figure out first, you know, who was hired after 2007. They will have to then recreate an I-9 uh, uh, application, an I-9 process, because the current uh, uh, e-verify requires that, uh, that you do current documents. And they, they tell me that's going to cost, you know, millions of manpower hours, thousands of manpower hours just to bring everybody back in for 250000 There are ways of doing this. Uh, Senator Obama had an amendment when he was a member of the Senate in 2007 that said, let's share the information with uh, the, the Social Security Administration, get a no match. Let DHS send a, a letter to the employer saying, re-verify these workers, but don't re-verify, you know, your entire workforce. If a small employer, we do not oppose the language that makes re-verification voluntary. Because if you have three employees, you and your cousin, you want to verify him, you know, that's fine. But all the large employers, which is the, the and all of them, again, are the ones that sign on this contract that you see verify, have told me that this is not uh, the way to go. Uh, finally, on the subcontractor, some contractor liability, uh, there was an amendment uh, that, that was presented in 2005. Chairwoman, you voted against it, but we, we would hope to have your support next time. Uh, but, you know, Congressman Duncan, Congressman Cuellar in 2005 voted to keep liability for contractors only if they knew that the subcontractor was violating the law. Because there's a lot of things on the MOU, and uh, the contractor cannot be held responsible for everything if, uh, because that's why you go with the subcontractor, so you don't have to uh, run the workforce. Finally, uh, in my last 10 seconds, I will just point out that we need to create one law. We need to uh, uh, strengthen the preemption language that we have because employers should be able to comply with immigration law by complying with uh, federal law. Thank you very much. We're now going to move to the question uh, period and we will proceed under our five-minute rule. Um, let me ask uh, Ms. McNeil first, uh, are adequate steps being taken by the Social Security Administration and the U.S. CIS to balance the requirements of E-Verified with ongoing agency demands? And are the additional agency staff members being hired to deal with an influx of queries uh, related to E-Verify or are existing staff members being reassigned? Well, I can, Madam Chairwoman, I can answer your question as far as, I think that, you know, right now the Social Security Administration and the Department of Homeland Security are well equipped to handle what we have now, which is and well equipped to handle the number of workers that could happen if we had a universal system. But I want to emphasize that 
a universal system might not be the silver bullet approach right now. And you know, I think they're well equipped at the moment. They have the right kind of staff in place. But a universal system, you know, they may not have the staff in place for that now. And I, I think that it shows that not only would a mandatory system right now not be the best approach for all industries, obviously when we want to move towards a system where everyone would use the system, use E-Verify, but I think that using it in a mandatory fashion right now would not be the best approach either from the government side or from the business side because we don't have the right things in place to ensure that all employers and the government are doing things in an accurate, cost-effective manner. Okay, and uh, with fewer than 2% of all employers enrolled in E-Verified, how can we possibly gauge whether the current system will be able to handle a rising number of queries on an annual basis? Well, I think, I think the, Madam Chairwoman, I think the biggest thing that shows how good this system is right now is that 96.9% .9 of the people who are put into E-Verify verify right now are getting a confirmation that says, you're great, go and work. And then two, only 2.8% 2 are actually getting a final non-confirmation. That shows how accurate the system is. It's really hard to find that level of accuracy in other databases and other parts of government. And this is the right kind of efficiencies that we need to have in the federal government. So I think that just the success of E-Verify on a small level shows the ability of DHS and, and the Social Security Administration to take this to a much larger scale. Mr. Amador, would you like to? Yes, I, I will point out, you know, the, the, the numbers on how you deal with accuracy uh, differ. And I, I, I want to point out that Intel Corporation did its own study as to the accuracy or how often did they get a tentative non-confirmation, something other than confirm uh, for their employees. And I'm, I want to compare it with the individual that testified that uses the verify for seven uh, Burger King franchises in Arizona. They both came back with, and about 15% of the time, they got an answer other than tentative non-confirmation. And every time that happens, because again, we're not just talking about swipe a car, green, red light, you get in or you get out. This is an employee you have. You have a number of other requirements. You need to be very careful that you do not change training, you do not change work hours, you do not change any of these things. So there are, uh, liability opens up and there are other burdens. And for them, the number they're looking at is 15%. It's not whether three months down the road, you finally fix the problem with the social security number. They're looking at, today I ran you through the system, it came as a TNC, what do I do now? And there is a process for that. So the, the, the two percent percent, one percent, or whatever number, it's up to Congress to decide what error rate they want to live with. It's not up for businesses. But since no program is going to be 100 percent accurate, you then need to look at the safeguards because employers and employees are going to have to live with this. There was a provision, again, in the Senate that passed that provided uh, lost wages for employees that at the end of the day got fired and it ended up being an error of the system. And even though Chertoff at the time was saying that this was a, a wonderful, almost perfect program, they opposed that amendment based on the lost wages and based on the fees uh, that employers would get, you know, if it was an error of the system. We are all for, you know, a mandated program, but we got to do it right because there will be errors and somebody is going to pay the consequences. Still a work in progress. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. And in what ways uh, have some of the recent enhancements to E-Verify, including the use of the uh, photo tool, helped improve the system for businesses? Well, it, it is an improvement on the system now. It also opens the employer for more liability. When, when we had uh, our witness testify, he said, well, I have a central location uh, where we do the, uh, uh, the, the I-9s and we put it in the system. So they were faxing the copy of the person's uh, ID to compare, to compare with the computer. The guy on the field will copy the license, fax it to the guy in the central office doing the E-Verify e on the computer, and now he's looking at a copy. Now he has to make a determination. And he said, you know, we, we found it more often than not. He's like, well, you know, how, how accurate is my comparison and what happens in an audit? When they go and do audits, we have an audit right now do, uh, on uh, 652 employers. I got a call from somebody who said that he was getting 47 citations out of the 59 I-9s he had on record because he failed to write the address of the employer. The employer is being, the I-9s are being kept at his side, he has his name, and he said, well, I'll write them right now. You know, well, you know, we were just being quick, we we're hiring a lot of people. He said, no, that's 47 citations. We need to make sure, and they look at E-Verify, yet, 
another potential for liability when they do audits and paperwork and other misuses other than, you know, not running somebody through the system. So that's the safeguards we're looking for. Well, with the concept of this is a work in progress, we would like to hear from you as to how you think we can perfect the system. Well, one of the things uh, we continue to say is that And as I said, you don't have to give us all your ideas. No, now. I, you I, can I understand. But one of the to. things that uh, should be instrumental is to yeah. start, start implementing a tier process. You know, go with, and it cannot be done by DHS. It has to be done by Congress. Start doing it in a tier process. 18,000% uh, 18, of uh, 18,000 firms basically hire 50% of all Americans. So, you know, it, it might make sense to go with uh, bigger employers first, but you need to also put those safeguards. And then as this comes up and you realize the problems that they have, then keep on going. But employers are different. You cannot expect somebody, that the four million that have zero to four employees, to have the same capacity as the uh, 18,000. Yes, and we're going to depend on you uh, letting us know what you think uh, we need to do to correct the system. Uh, we're going to hold another hearing down the line, too, on E-Verify, just to see what we need to do in terms of policy. And now I would like to call on uh, Congressman Duncan of Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, uh, Mr. Amador, you uh, make a point that th this system, uh, while it's usually referred to as being a free system, it's not really free to businesses. Uh, what could you uh, elaborate on that a little bit, and and how much it might cost? And and I assume that it's, it varies from employer to employer. For instance, I've noticed over the years that a company like UPS, uh, when I go visit UPS facilities, I'll find people that work there commonly 20 or 25 years. Yet fast food places, they have some of them 300 percent, 400 percent a year turnover. So people work an average of three or four or six months there, and yeah. Uh, what, how does that factor in? Yeah, the, the, I guess our view is that there's no such thing as a, as a free lunch and there's no such thing as a free mandate, uh, and this is a perfect example. If you need to spend, you, you need to spend time, one of the biggest uh, uh, expenses, according to uh, 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 this gentleman, Mitchell Laird from uh, Arizona, uh, who owns seven you know, Burger King franchises, that they have a high turnover rate. So you need to take people out of you know, the work, the system managers that are doing the hiring uh, to train them. And the training alone, and you, you basically get hit twice. You know, you have the, the person in training and you don't have them at the work site. Um, the fact that you have all these new employees, you need to continuously be running these individuals. Then you have large companies who have other concerns. When you talk about the large federal contractor, they say, well, we don't really have a big problem using E-Verify now for new hires, but we would have a big problem if we need to go out. Uh, I mean, Ingersoll Rand, which is our immigration subcommittee chair, uh, has 45,000 employees, and they're all over the United States. They don't have a centralized system. They say, we're going to have to start paying for auditors to go over there. We need to bring everybody in and give them a training so everybody does it the same way. Because if the moment one place starts doing it different, then you have to, well, wait a second. What are you trying to do? You're trying to discriminate against people in Texas versus people in Washington. So w w those are all costs, you know, the training and the facilities and, and the manpower and the Hours is, is a big concern for them. Do you think that? Do you think that because this is such a big and overwhelming problem that uh, um, it's just it's just going to be impossible to uh, do something about? Do you? I mean, do you feel like uh, that uh, uh, we're tilting at windmills here or beating our heads against uh, concrete walls? Do you, do you think we should just have open borders and not do anything about uh, illegal immigration? No, no, not at all. And I think we can <clears throat> even mandate an employment verification program. But what we have continued to say is we want to make sure, and even outside of comprehensive reform, what my members are telling me, we just need to make sure that it's the right program and it has a sa the, the right safeguards. You know, it is for Congress to decide what error level they can live with. Uh, if you want to mandate it on federal contractors, then, you know, we, we want to sit down with you and tell you, well, this is what the federal contractors, particularly the ones that are using it right now, are telling me they, they could live with and, and, and ways of fixing, addressing the issues. For example, if what you want to do is figure out whether the name, which is what E-Verify does, the name and social security number of those currently working uh, match, there's a process for that. Now, the numbers go to the Social Security Administration, and there was an amendment that put the burden on DHS uh, to send a letter to the employer saying verify these individuals. 
and the employers are willing to do that. So that's a way of doing that. Uh, Reverification, uh, as Grassley, Barkers, and Obama said in the letter to Chertoff, shouldn't be a requirement. Subcontractor contractor liability. The amendment from uh, Congressman Westmoreland that, you know, I thank you for your vote in favor of it, um, stated as long as the contractor didn't know what the subcontractor was doing in, in, in his internal operations of the system, he should not be held liable. That is current law. If the contractor is trying to hire a subcontractor to get around immigration law, yes, hold him liable, but not create vicarious liability for a contractor to be held liable. You know, these are the kinds of things that if you put them in a mandatory employment verification system, employers will be able to get behind it. Now, a blanket language like the one that is coming from the Senate on the Department of Homeland Security Appropriations, we oppose because it, it doesn't create exemptions like even the ones on the regulation for uh, commercial over-the-shelf uh, items uh, or small employers, or, uh, and it has a, a broad mandate for re-verification. We have always opposed that. We let opposed me, it in 2005, and we still oppose me, it today. Let me say, before my time runs out, uh, first of all, I think that your suggestion about uh, going to the biggest employers first uh, makes, uh, is, is just common sense, and secondly, uh, almost all federal contracts are so ridiculously lucrative, uh, it seems to me that uh, we should uh, require first uh, um, compliance with, uh, uh, by federal contractors. But uh, let me ask you, Ms. McNeil, of the, uh, may maybe this testimony has already been given when I wasn't here, maybe I missed it, but uh, of the six million inquiries, uh, how many uh, uh, em employees are found to be illegal out of that six million. Do you have those figures? I don't have those figures on hand. I'd be happy to see if I could find them and provide them for you for the record. However, I will say that 2.8% you know, of the people are found to be final non-confirmations. And both Pew Hispanic Center and the Center for Immigration Studies estimated that the amount of unauthorized workers in the workforce was about four to five percent. So it's okay. about on average. Well, that's, that's good enough. Yeah. Thank and, you. Uh, have there uh, have there been any uh, examples of anybody who's uh, any legal worker who's lost his uh, his or her job due to incorrect information under this system? Well, there are going to be people who were denied positions because they were final non-confirmations, but that doesn't mean that they were necessarily denied incorrectly for the position. But I'll, I'll also say, Congressman, that if there's a situation where it becomes a discriminatory situation, where it's a pre-screening thing that's against E-Verify, uh, you know, there's penalties in place for that. And I think that we need to educate employers better on figuring out how to use E-Verify in, in an effective way, because a lot of employers are confused on subjects such as how to use E-Verify in the way that actually meets the law. So I think that that's also an important element is that education angle. As well. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Madam Chairman. If I could pick up on my friend from Tennessee's questioning. Um, isn't it true that that 2.8 percent you're referring to, it, they may be denied employment because they are found to be non-compliant. Is that not correct? That's absolutely true. But, but the system doesn't tell you whether the non-compliance is as to their immigration status or just the failure to provide proper documentation. Congressman, that's absolutely correct. So there's no way you're ever going to get back to Mr. Duncan giving him numbers about here is the estimated number of illegals the system has caught. For example, um, I only have eight days in which to provide a birth certificate, for example, or a marriage certificate. And if I'm in California applying as a new hire for a job and those documents are back home in Virginia, it's conceivable, bureaucracies being bureaucracies, that that documentation just is not forthcoming within the requisite time period. Is that not correct? That's absolutely correct, and I think we need to work on that, on and, the accuracy, absolutely. And, and I would be found to be non-compliant in failing to provide that documentation and thus not to be hired. Is that correct? It's, it's very possible that that could happen, Your Honor, or excuse and, me, Congressman. And, and I would just say, if, if I were a major employer, even if I were a small business employer, that would concern me because not, you know, I, as an individual, I'm not in control of how quickly such documentation may be made available to me, and not everyone can fly back to the state capitol and get that birth certificate. 
And I think that that, Congressman, I think that makes the point for why we need to work on the accuracy of E-Verify for those exact situations that are very few and far between. But I don't think it's a, a reason to derail E-Verify as a useful tool no. in enforcement. But I, I'm just pointing out a potential flaw in the system that doesn't really capture whether someone's here illegally or not. It may just capture the failure for whatever reason to provide the necessary documentation. And Congressman, I think we absolutely want any, uh, any American worker or legal immigrant that's here to work, I th we want the, to get them into those positions. So I think working to remedy errors and accuracy and, and making it so that people can fix stuff easily is, is vital to the process. And Mr. Amador, I want to give you an opportunity to comment on this as well, because I, I see this as a potential inefficiency we're adding with the best of intentions that we got to address. But let me just say, you were way too modest just a little bit earlier in your testimony referring to the fact that maybe there was only one area you were at this chamber and AFL <laughs> were in agreement on. I want to remind you that, of course, I was only too happy to support the chamber's position on the Economic Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which you supported, and I also would note, which as did the AFL CIO. And I also uh, would note that you have come out, the Chamber's come out in support of the reauthorization of the Transportation re, uh, yes, we have. Uh, Surface Transportation <laughs> Act, known as Safety Lou, also supported by FLCO and also certainly supported by me. So you were way too modest <laughs> in talking about common ground just a little bit yeah. earlier. No, I would, I would say that uh, on immigration and, and, and employer issues, we do meet more often uh, and, and reach agreement more often and, you know, the lawsuits. I mean, I haven't seen any lawsuit except dealing with uh, immigration issues where the, the first words is AFL and U.S. Chamber as opposed to AFL versus U.S. Chamber or vice versa. <laughs> um, I, I would point out that that few and far between is fine as long as you're not the one that lost the job. Right. Uh, uh, what we're saying is for these individuals, whether it's one person or whether it's ten, and, and again, you know, that's a, a, an argument made stronger by, you know, the, the civil rights groups. Uh, uh, we didn't support or oppose the uh, uh, lost wages provision. Our concern was, well, let's make sure they don't come after the employer because we are just uh, doing the government's job. And I, I always find interesting that that was the one reason why DHS at the time came after the, the amendment. He said, oh, wait a second, we cannot be paying back lost wages. I said, well, if it's an error in the system, if the person were willing to put protections, I said, well, the person must follow all the steps, they must do everything, but if at the end of the day, you didn't get your papers on time and you were fired because we were asked to fire you, then you should have some recourse. And, uh, and these are the kinds of things that need to be addressed. We're not saying do not move forward with E-Verify, but as you make an E-Verify mandate stronger and you hold employers accountable for the results of E-Verify, you need to also provide the protections for both employers and their employees. And that's why I said, you know, E-Verify is good, but I, I, just saying far, few and far between and ignoring it is not the right way to go. Let's make sure we do it right so we can all, again, we're all gonna have to live with it. And on the requirements, whether we use it right or wrong, you pointed out something to the prior panel that, that is very uh, important here. These rules keep on changing. Employers would like to start verifying individuals before they even start, uh, start to work because they would like to know if there's gonna be any problem. That's illegal today. We've been asking for it. Employers do not want to re-verify. That's illegal. One of the things UPS pointed out is this is it was illegal. It is on their labor contracts, and most of the drivers are members of uh, unions, that they cannot re-verify this workforce. And they're trying to figure out if we have to go back, how do we renegotiate that with the unions? Because now we're going to be in breach of a contract, and you know, negotiating with unions is not always, from yes. our perspective, one of the and, easiest and, things to do. And Mr. Amador, did, did you cite the statistic I thought I heard you say a little bit earlier? that uh, when you look at the number of new hires every year in the United States, it's approaching 60 million. Correct. So if we had a 2.8% non-compliance rate, for whatever reason, that's a lot of people. That's almost 1.8 million people, is that not correct? That's correct. So it sounds like it's, you know, an acceptable statistical margin of error, but it's actually a lot of people denied employment and when you start with federal contractors, I end on this note, Madam Chairman, the problem is it's not just, gee, I could get fined if I get you wrong, so let's put you over there and hopefully you get your documentation and, and then we can consider your employment. There may be hundreds of millions of dollars of federal contracts at stake, your collateral damage. I haven't got time to wait for 
verification of the documents to arrive in time. And so I, I am a little bit worried about that because with the best of intention moving forward, um, there are a lot of people who could fall through the cracks purely innocently because of the mail system or the lack of responsiveness by some other bureaucracy somewhere else providing a document. Uh, and, I, and I hope we're going to monitor that very carefully. And, and, and the 15 percent that came tentative non-confirmed in Intel, they were all confirmed at the end of the day. Yeah. But that takes a, a, a long time, and it takes help from the employer as well. Yes. I thank you. My time's up, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Are there other questions? Yes. Um, Mr. Amador, the yeah. percentage that you were talking about, the 4 percent we're playing around with, the over, would you agree that the overwhelming majority of that percentage either do not contest the ruling or um, um, the uh, or found to be not qualified? Most of them do not contest the ruling. Right. Why would they not contest it? Uh, well, according to uh, uh, the government study, they said because they go to another job, it takes too long, and they do something else. They can move in you the don't, yeah, In other words, you don't think the majority of non-contestants are people who aren't qualified? Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in that field. That's what the government is saying, and I'll, I'll go with what the independent study says. Okay. The, the fact is, is that we have 1,000 new employees voluntarily going onto a system right now. I don't know. Um, we're sitting at 94 percent efficiency. Can you show a federal program that you know of that is at that level of efficiency today? I'm not an expert in other programs. Okay. I, I don't have a actual data for a specific database, but I, I would say that that's a high level, high level of efficiency and accuracy for a federal government database. Yeah, I learned, and let me just say this. I don't know. Uh, we forget about what the old system is. My family's been in the tax business since the year I was born. Um, I guess my mother decided to look one look at me and decided to get in another business than having children. <laughs> but that's a separate issue. Uh, look, has anybody, have you ever experienced a situation where somebody gets your Social Security number? And uses it, um, and uses it to file. Or do you know of anybody that's ever run into the old system where the fraud of of the illegal use of a social security number and the problems that are related to that? Excuse me. Sorry, I didn't understand the question. I, are you aware of the problems with the old system, with the fraud um, occurring from somebody using someone else's social security number and the complications that caused for the innocent bystander whose number has been picked up and used for? illegal employment or for uh, to avoid detection on that? I'm aware that all the studies, including the government, state that E-Verify is going to make that problem worse because people are going to be looking for real social security numbers and name, which is what it does. It matches the, the number to the name. Well, I, you, you know, let me, let me say the E-Verify, the way we're, we're busting that now is through electronic filing, sir. So it's just the opposite. The trouble is, is that when you get notified that your tax return can't be filed, you're saying that you think E-Verify will cause more fraud in the system than the paper system that we have now, that we've had for the last 30 years. What I'm saying years. is that the government study that looked at it, and GAO as well, stated that e, that E-Verify promotes more uh, identity fraud because now instead of just making a social security number in paper and having IDs that look real, you need somebody's actual name and social security number, and they're saying the E-Verify is promoting that. Again, SWIFT that was raided, uh, and they found all these undocumented, they were using actual, they, they had all been through E-Verify, and they all had real names and real social security numbers. You got a comment there? Uh, Congressman, I, th I think the point to be made is that Mr. Armador is correct about, you know, that there, there is problems with identity theft and with off-the-books employment that E-Verify right now, it, they're working towards it, but they can't catch that right now. But that's why I would emphasize that E-Verify is a great tool for document fraud we should implement it. And then we should also follow up with things like Social Security no match, enforcement, investigations, and other things that help us squeeze out the process. You know, you stop people first from document fraud, then you, you know, we, eventually we're going to get to a workforce that's But as the other, workforce. as the previous um, witnesses pointed out, this is not in isolation. We've got now um, online um, the Real ID Bill so that the base documents will have the electronic capability where an employer now will have more reliable tools to draw on for identification. And won't you agree that 
We, we, we the state supported issued identification, when it's upgraded to the real ID standard, will help substantially in addressing this issue from an employee's point of view. Well, I haven't, I haven't, we haven't taken a position on the real ID, so I don't know about the real ID standard. I'm not talking about the law itself. I'm talking about the application of biometric um, fraud resistant documentation to be able to be presented to the employee. We have always asked for, first we asked for the list of identification that was accepted on the I-9 to be narrow because we think it's too broad. Uh, we have. Uh, ask for at least a study on making the social security card, which is one of the ideas that is allowed under the current system, to be at least made plastic. You know, is there uh, a reason, to, in your opinion, that we, as a federal government, have not upgraded the social security card since 1937 when it was introduced? And why is the federal government federal Im identification document for employment a piece of paper with a name and a number when no other government agency that I know of is using that technology today. Do you have any? I guess I guess the, the view is that it's expensive. You know, that's not our view. We are in favor of updating the uh, the social security card. We would love for the social security number to be card to be updated because that is you know prime form of identification. Uh, I, I think from what I have read is the main the main reason is the cost. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. If there's no other questions. Madam Chairman? Yes. If I might, I, I just, if I might just say to my good friend from California, I, I do not uh, disagree with him about the, uh, uh, the benefits of the E-Verify program potentially and really. My concern is that we, as quickly as we can, identify what could go wrong, though, in anticipation of that so we can manage it and we can address those issues rather than having a program get very far down the road and very large only to discover we have all kinds of problems. And I know like my friend from California, I'm always skeptical of anything that has a whiff of being an unfunded mandate because having been in local governments, we know the burden <laughs> that can put on. I, I, and I appreciate that. And my, um, my biggest concern is the fact that um, as somebody who comes from local government like you, is utilizing those resources in the most cost-effective way. And that rather than having, that's why real ID is so essential, it eliminates the need for citizens to have a federal ID if states are upgraded to a minimum federal standard. You avoid the federal ID issue. But the feds do have an obligation here, as the representative of the chamber pointed out, that while everyone else is improving and has evolved, it appears to the public that the federal government has a constant strategy of saying we won't upgrade and the cost issue just evaporates when you look at I don't see that as being the argument used by local governments across this country for upgrading driver's licenses um, over the years, but the political aspect of it. And, and I'll just point out that one of the greatest breakthroughs for the consumer in privacy and in efficiency that the IRS has implemented is the e-filing. It has been such a great breakthrough and it's been one of the greatest helps at detect early detection of fraud because before somebody could steal your, li your, your social security number, file under your number and you would never know about it until years later until you're audited for income that you didn't declare, that you didn't even know, but it got filed. Today, you are notified um, within, you know, within a short period of time that there, well, in fact, you can't file your tax return if somebody's filed your number ahead of time. It notifies you, so you get that warning. E-filing has been a great breakthrough. I think that this technology is one of those things we need to embrace, we need to improve. We shouldn't accept it as a god, but we darn well want to see it as a great tool that we need for it. And the private sector has gone to it. And I know I'll just say this about E-Verify. UPS, or, or Visa, since 1970, has handled trillions of transactions. And it is the standard for every citizen that I know of in, in cash exchanges and everything else. If they've been able to do it since 1970, the federal government should be able to uh, transfer numbers and information at least half as efficiently. So I think there's the big challenge we have there. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Then. Yes, I would want to thank the panel for your testimony. and. Uh, for the information of our members, we will have a follow-up hearing, and I'd like to invite our witnesses and those in the audience that are vested in E-Verify, contact us with ideas of how we can improve. 
Uh, we do have to commit uh, the dollars if we broaden the system and correct any weaknesses in it. That would be a consideration. There was a suggestion uh, with the committee, uh, at the committee today by Ms. Spears that we find out some way to maybe charge for this service. And, and we oppose that. You oppose it. Yes, Chamber <laughs> of Commerce speaking. And uh, that's not uh, anything that uh, we would say would be factual, but it did come up in the testimony. And so if there are no further questions, uh, I thank you. And uh, you may be excused. We appreciate your testimony. And uh, this particular meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>
I'm so sorry. I'm just so stressed out. You know, with Jabari on the dope and all. Guys, there has to be some way to get Aaron out of this. There's a lot of things we can do, all right? We could implore Congress to cut off funding. We could march on Washington. We could call for impeachment. We could stop this war dead in its tracks. And how are we supposed to do that in the next two days? I don't know. I'm just an ideal person. Hey, Aaron. We just wanted you to know we're going to be thinking about you and praying for you. Oh, thanks, man. We love you, man. We're going to keep a love chain going for you here on the home front. What? I don't know what that means. Or why I said it. But we do love you, man. We're gonna keep it going. <laughs> hey, we got you some. Ooh, I hope it's a big get out of Iraq free card. <laughs> it's a bulletproof vest. And one of those helmet liners. We didn't know what your head size was, so we sort of went largest. <laughs> well, um... I'd like to say you shouldn't have, but unfortunately, I know what's what over there, so thank you. It's the least we could do. If there's anything that you need, you let us know. Yeah, um, y'all could do something for me. Can you look after Joan? She insists on staying in our house. You got it. No, really. I need y'all to look after her, because those women in there... Can't keep water wet. Yeah, we know. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what else to do. I emailed my congressmen, my senators. I even called the NAACP. Why? I don't know. I mean, Aaron's a colored people. I figured they could advance and pass Iraq. Hmm. What are they going to do? They can't even advance past the words colored people. Maya, I blame your cousin. Ronnie, girl, please. You can't do nothing but hair. No. Condoleezza Rice, she could have ended this war. Oh, Condi? She can't say no to her man. Yeah, but don't you think if you called her that she could help Aaron? Oh, girl, please. I mean, Condoleezza probably can't even be reached. I mean, you know, she could be in, in Lebanon, Dubai, playing golf with Tiger, secretary Ising the state. <laughs> please, Maya. Oh, girl, please. You know, I can't call Condi. I mean, you know, the family's just all up in arms over everything that's just been going on with... All right, look. Condi ain't really my cousin. What? 